Good evening. It is June 23rd, 2021. Welcome to the virtual midweek Bible study of the Palmyra Church of Christ in Palmyra, Indiana. Bible study, pal. I'm Greg Circle, the preacher for the Church of Christ here in Palmyra, and we welcome you as we continue studying from the book of Matthew. As we continue looking at uh, the fourth part, we're going to close out the fourth part today, and then next Wednesday we will start uh, with part five, where Jesus gets into this last great sermon, um, three whole chapters, uh, just like the Sermon on the Mount. So interesting that it starts with, that first main section starts with a three-chapter sermon, and then this last section is going to start with a three-chapter sermon as well. And then we get to uh, one of the greatest battles that Jesus or anyone has to fight. Uh, well, I guess it's a battle that we ourselves never really have to fight, but we'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, right now, let's get into uh, studying from the book of Matthew, and we're going to be in chapter 22 today to finish out. So let's get set up there. Matthew chapter 22, we're going to finish up the battles uh, for the kingdom, battles of the kingdom, and we're going to start with... Uh, Battle or chapter 22 is all about the battle of a or for a proper mindset, and we're going to look at several different aspects of uh, our mindset that, that we ought to have that we battle um, every day, perhaps. Well, maybe not every day, but, but we battle often, and everyone has to battle, everyone has to make this battle, fight these battles. Uh, to have the proper mindset, to, to be focused on Jesus and focused on. This on the spirituality of uh, of Christianity, and, and have our have our focus on those things that are above. It's so difficult. Well, let's let's put it this way: it is so easy to have our minds focused on the things of the earth. It's so easy to to focus on the things that are here and now, and because we don't fully understand what's to come, but we still have that battle to fight. We have to have that proper mindset uh, that. There are things that we can't see. Uh, God is spirit, and we have to really focus on getting our mindset right. So let's talk about the battle for a proper mindset, and let's first start with a mindset for a proper response, proper response to the invitation of Jesus. So we start in verses 1 through 10. And we read, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted, fattened livestock are all butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was enraged, and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. So I think it goes back to something Jesus talked about in the previous chapter, um, where he talked about how uh, tax collectors and prostitutes would enter into the kingdom before the the hypocrites and, and the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes. Um, well... Why would they? Why would the scribes and Pharisees not enter? Why would the tax collectors and the prostitutes enter before those who were religious? Because they would not accept the invitation of the king. The king gives a wedding feast for his son, and you're not willing to go. You're invited, but you don't go. Uh, that's that says something, doesn't it? Well, so that we have to have the proper response. When God invites us, 
And really, he invites all to be a part of the kingdom, um, to be a part of this feast. And uh, he invites all, and it's, it's up to us to take that invitation. And so many people will, well, they'll go to their own homes or they'll go to their own businesses. Um, they, they may even seize the slaves, the, the, wo- the ones with the invitation, and mistreat them and kill them. They'll, they'll say, no, thank you, but they'll do it in, in that way. And that's just, that's not a proper response. So we have to have the, the act the right mindset, the proper mindset to accept this invitation. You know, we have to know that there's no better invitation that we could we could receive. Jesus offers that invitation and we need to accept it. So after the proper response, we need to make sure that when we do get to the wedding feast, we are in the proper attire. We have to have the right mindset to have our attire correct. When the king came in, now this is continuing in the same parable, to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness in that place There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. You know, there's a this this guy is pictured as being out of place. Uh, He's probably sticking out like a sore thumb, and uh, he is not properly attired. He did not come into the wedding feast with the right attitude. I wonder how many ways we could look at this, and wonder what which way God wants us to look at this. You know, we could look at this as those who are not ready. Um, Those who are not ready can't enter. There's Maybe there has to be some preparation. And the preparation for obeying the gospel isn't, isn't much, but you still have to hear. You have to understand there is a God who wants to save and wants to reconcile all mankind to himself, and he sent his one-of-a-kind son to be the propitiation for our sins so that we can have that reconciliation. He was just, but this man was was out of place. There's also, you know, perhaps he's in his own rebellion. You know, the, the first group rebelled because, uh, or they rebelled by not taking the invitation, not accepting the invitation. But this man rebels by entering into this wedding feast put on by the king for his son, the prince. And he he walks in, I don't know, in his Def Leppard t-shirt. I don't know, that's the first thing that came to my mind. You know, in our time, that we wouldn't bat an eye at that. But, well, I don't know, would we? You get invited to, well, let's say the White House. You get invited to the White House, and are you going to wear, are are you even going to wear a polo shirt and and khaki cargo shorts? No, you're probably going to go get a new suit, new suit and tie, or if you're a lady, you're going to get a new dress, new fancy not costume, but a fancy dress, and you're going to you're going to make sure you're all clean, you're all set up for meeting some very high profile people, and you're not going to go in in you know tattered jeans or anything like that. Uh, well, how does this apply though to? To the kingdom, how does it apply to Christians? What's what's the battle? What's our mindset that we need to fight for? Well, when we go to church, we always ought to be dressed to the nines. We ought to have 
men ought to have shirt and tie and the, their jacket buttoned up. Um, they ought to have their shoes black, polished, and women ought to be dressed up in their their finest dress with, you know, nice set of matched pearls and, you know, all put together. No. No, that's we're not talking about outward appearance, are we? We're not talking about outward appearance. When we when we go to church, yeah, I, I do believe we ought to be dressed you know, fairly well. We ought to be dressed in a way that shows hey, we know that this is important. Um, we ought not to be a distraction. So, but we ought to, more importantly, though, be clothed in good works. And that's the attitude that we need to have. We need to have, have the attitude of, hey, we're, we're, Worshiping God, and you know, we don't want you know to go in with a, a stain on our clothes. We need to always be be clean and have clean clothing on. And and again, using Peter's uh, illustration in another place, being and he uses it for women, but I think for men as well, be clothed with good works. So. Have that proper, you know, this is the battle for the proper mindset. And one of the ways that you get into proper mindset is a proper attire. And whether that's outward physical clothes or inward um, mental men mentality and in, in, uh, inward mindset, um, being clean from sin, having our sins forgiven, I think that's probably the more important one, but Again, I think there is something to dressing uh, the part that you know uh, dressing dressing for the the worship. But again, it's not quite as important as having on putting on good proper good works proper attire. All right, the next battle that we have, and this might be a big one. This might be a big one. Is we need to have the battle for a proper mindset on ownership. Ownership of what in particular? Well, everybody is pretty familiar with this verse, or this passage. In uh, verses 15 through 22, the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one for you are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful for is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And hearing this, they were amazed, and leaving him, they went away. So uh, Matthew points out that this is what the Pharisees are, are trying to do. They're trying to catch him, uh, and they're even bringing in some friends uh, in the Herodians. Um, not sure how close of friends they are. This may be more of an enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of thing, but um, I love how they, they try to they think they're buttering Jesus up. You know, they think they're um, they're trying to boost his ego so that uh, he'll uh, he'll make a mistake. I mean, I, I guess that's what they're trying to do. Um, but you know, Jesus doesn't need that. Jesus is perfect. Jesus is God, and it doesn't work. And I, th I think it's funny that this is what they're trying to do, you know. So they, they say, I, we really want to know what you think. Your your opinion really matters. It, it carries a lot of weight. Um, and it really does, but they don't really think so. So they ask this question, is it lawful to give a poll tax? Is it lawful to pay your taxes? And I know everyone goes to this verse and and, you know, thinks it's 
talking about even our modern day taxes. And, you know, there's a reason we pay taxes. Paul deals with that in Romans chapter 13. Um, and, you know, so that government can do its God, you know, its God-given job of punishing the wicked and defending the innocent. Um, but is it is it lawful to give a tax? And I guess, you know, they're trying to, you know, get Jesus to side with either the Herodians who are, if I'm not mistaken, they're the ones who really want to be, um, they want to be linked with Rome. They, they don't mind having Rome. They have a lot of clout and authority in the Roman system. And they also have, uh, he's also got the other side, may include the Pharisees a little bit, may include, the, definitely includes the Zealots uh, who are saying, no, we need to throw off the Roman shackles. And so answering yes or no to this question is going to alienate some. Instead, the answer that he gives really alienates almost everybody. But, <laughs> um, but that's well, we can talk about that in a little bit. It, it either it alienates both sides who want that question answered definitively. But to answer the question yes or no with just one word, yes or no, misses the point. And Jesus says you got to get the point. You have this. You got to have this proper idea this proper attitude, this proper mindset of who owns what. How do you tell? Well, look at the coin. Who owns this coin? Whose picture is it? Who's, who's got its name on it? And if you look at even one of our coins, you know, it's got a picture of a famous president, an important person in history, and it's got the inscription, of, you know, various inscriptions of the United States. Of America. And who does that belong to? Well, it belongs to the United States. It's, it's what the government uses to, uh, to allow transactions to happen. Uh, kind of uniformly, it's how everybody decides. It's, it's currency. And they had their currency. And so it, that currency had Caesar's. So had Caesar's likeness, his image, and his inscription, his name written on it. So give that to him. That's his. But whose likeness are you made in? Are you cast in? Whose likeness do you have? Whose inscription is on you, is in your heart? Where, whose name is on you? It's God's. God created man in his image. We have the breath of God, the breath that gives life. And that's the point that he tries to make. Yeah, I know you go to Romans 13 and, you know, that's where you find the point about, you know, we pay taxes to, you know, give taxes to whom taxes are due, custom to whom custom, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, pay what you need because the government is there. They, they don't bear the sword in vain. They go to protect those, those taxes go to protect those who are innocent. At least that's the idea. Now, all kinds of other things we can get into, but that's not really what we want to talk about. Um, we want to talk about the idea of having a proper mindset of who owns me. And I know in America, we're all individualistic or at least, you know, that's, that's traditionally how we are. That's how I am as as an American. But at the same time, I know God is my king. Jesus is my king. So, and I want to make sure that I give to him, to serve him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, so, and this answer seemed to make them quiet, seemed to shut them up. Uh, at least for a little bit, and they left. They went away because he answered it just as he should have, just as he needed help or he needed to answer it. So 
that's the proper mindset we need to have. We need to, we have this battle uh, for the proper mindset of to whom do you belong? You belong to God. Uh, this is the next battle that we have to fight for the proper mindset is a proper mindset about life. And what is life? What is the life that's important? If we go to chapter 22, verses 23 through 33, on that day, some Sadducees, so the other side, uh, who say there is no resurrection. And so he puts that in parenthesis to, you know, that's a parenthetical statement that, uh, that helps us to understand who the Sadducees are. They say there is no resurrection. They came to Jesus and questioned him, asking, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers with us, and the first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother, so also the second and the third, down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they, are, they all had married her. But Jesus answered and said to them, You're mistaken, not understanding the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but, the God, uh, but of the living. And when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. So the, the proper life that we need to keep in our minds, that we, we have to battle our mindset uh, for, to have the proper idea of, idea of, is eternal life. The fact that we will all be somewhere for, an, for eternity. Um, and that's shown in the fact that God says, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He's not, it's not, I was the God of, it's I am the God of. And so, he is the God of the living. But also, I want to point out that, you know, we look at this life, we look at this physical life, and we see people come and go. We see them live, we see them die. We see them pass from the life. And, you know, we have these rules that... <clears throat> Like, for instance, the Sadducees, they say, we have this rule, we don't understand why. It makes no sense in, in how we view things. And, you know, that's a good point. I think that's an interesting point that the Sadducees make. Except, you know, they, Jesus is teaching them here to not assume that there's nothing after here. There's nothing after this life. That's why he brings in the resurrection. You know, he they ask a question about the Leverite marriage. And Jesus says, Look, you're, you're missing the point of what the afterlife is like. Number one, they don't believe in an afterlife, but they're missing the point of what the afterlife is like. We, we will all be changed. Uh, our mortal will put on ir immortal. Our corruption will put on incorruption. Um, and for whatever, however that works, however it works, in the resurrection, we neither marry nor are given in marriage, but we're like the angels. We don't, you know, we won't have a sex, gender. You know, we'll all be, I'm not sure exactly how it works, but that doesn't change how anything here happens, how anything here works. God created the physical for, um, you know, for reasons. And the physical includes male and female. Uh, now, the physical is male and female, but but when we get to the spiritual, that that kind of goes away. And the question is, did they follow what God's plan was? Did all seven brothers and the wife follow what God's plan was? The assumption is yes, they did, and well, that's how the story goes. But, but they're the point is that they were missing something. They were missing something in not believing in the resurrection. 
See, they were using, they used this arg argument as a way to say that the resurrection makes no sense. But when they correct that argument, when Jesus corrects that argument, now the resurrection can make sense. Or actually, it's the Leverite law that doesn't make any sense if there's a resurrection. Now, everything makes a little more sense, or at least it should, to those who are listening. Um, but the point is, God is the God of the living. And he's a God that gives us a good a life, an abundant life. Uh, let's see, the next thing that we need to look at in our battle for a proper mindset is uh, our battle for proper service, proper service to God. So we go back to the uh, Pharisees here. And when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, uh, which they were pretty happy for, and just think, it's like, it would be like... Uh, the Democrats rejoicing that Jesus silenced the Republicans, or vice versa. You know, I, I'm happy if either side is silenced, but, you know. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together, one of them a lawyer, and asked him a question, testing him, Teacher, which is the greatest, great, great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and prophets. And so how do we serve God? How do we serve God? And that's the mindset we need to, we need the battle to have. We need to have the proper mindset in our service to God. And that's giving God our all. He has given us everything. And uh, well, going back to what Jesus said about the coin, um, to render to God what is God's, He has given us His image, and therefore we are His. And so we are to give it back. We are to give ourselves back to Him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. And um, we also add strength to that in other places, but the, the point is still the same. With your whole being, you're to serve God. Uh, and that's the, that's the first and foremost commandment that we need to keep. And that they need to keep, but I think also that, that kind of goes into today, because it is it is about the mindset that we have. You know, if you're only half-hearted in your service to God, or if your mind is... Somewhere else when you're serving God. And, you know, just I, I have to be careful because minds wander. But, you know, the idea is you're, you're thinking about it. You want to serve God. And, and even if your mind wanders a little bit every once in a while, you always come back to serving God. Um, that's what we need to do. That's our proper service to Him, to give Him our all every day. And, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, every day that you know, we have to go to, to worship, but, but we have to live our lives as if we're worshiping God. You know, we are a living sacrifice. We are a living sacrifice given to God. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, golden rule, uh, do unto others as you would have them do to you. I mean, that's, that's just another way to say the golden rule. and But when you look at it, he says, on these two commandments depend the whole law and prophets. And really, that's it. And really, if you go back to the Ten Commandments even, the first six commandments deal with our relationship to God, and the last four deal with our relationship towards other people. And so, yeah, God and others. Um, so, kind of like that acronym, JOY, Jehovah first, others second, yourself last. And on this depends the whole Law and Prophets. And when you go back and, and look at the Law and the Prophets, you see that. You know, you need to serve God. You need to give back to God. 
and you need to follow his commands. You need to be faithful to him. And, oh, yeah, if you see a stranger who is in need of something, give it. Um, so proper service uh, is another battle in, or another skirmish in the battle for a proper mindset. And we also have to, and this, this is kind of related to it, we also have to have the proper Lord uh, in, our, in our mindset. We have to know who our Lord is. To whom do we belong? Who is our king? And so the Pharisees continue asking him, or continue talking to him. When the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. Uh, forgive my Bible program here. Apparently the markup was wrong and they put some red letters where the red letters don't belong, but you know, that's just the way it is sometimes. Um, but let's let's look at this passage a little bit. Um, you know, they were the Pharisees and many of the Jews of the time were all about David, David, David. He I mean he is he was the, he's, he's the greatest king. Um, I mean, Solomon had his points too, but, you know, David's the king that everybody looked up to, and David was the king who had the promise given to him that from uh, him, uh, this lineage would, would continue uh, for all eternity. Um, but, you know, the focus is so much on David, and in another place, uh, Jesus points out their focus on being, actually it's John the Baptizer, points out their focus on being sons of Abraham. Um, but they're missing the point that Abraham had somebody above him. David had a king above him. David, the, the king of Israel, calls someone else Lord. Who is that? The son of uh, the son of David. David's son, David's descendant, is his Lord, is David's Lord. And if you want to be, if you want to follow after David, then you need to follow his Lord as well. Um, if David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Well, the whoever the Messiah was going to be, and maybe this was an issue they had, they weren't exactly sure how this Messiah would, would play out, but he's pointing out to them, Jesus is pointing out to him that he is the son of David, and that he is above David, even. He is the proper Lord. Okay. Well, I think that's... Um, that's as far as we're going to get tonight. Just double check here. But that is the end of the chapter. No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. And it's important that we, we look at that because of what's coming next. The next chapter begins the last section. We're already in the last week of Jesus' life, but this last section begins, and they're done talking to him. They're done trying to figure out, you know, if they can get him and they can change him in some way, or maybe even if they can use him in some way, some sort of pawn. They can't. They're done, and they're going to move on with their plan. Um, you know, we can talk about, we'll talk about that in the next few weeks as we continue on. Now, next week, uh, we'll be looking at the sermon. Um, at least we'll begin looking at it, verses 
or chapters 23 through 25. And then, and then we get to the last few days, um, last three days even of Jesus' life here on earth. And then we'll get into the resurrection and, you know, it's, it all wraps up um, with God's plan. Uh, God's plan was to save mankind, to give this sacrifice for the sins of everyone. Um, but how do you take part in that? How do you take part in that? Well, God says, be faithful. To be faithful to him. To, to have this proper mindset that he is God. You are his creation. You bear his image. And he wants you to be returned to him. He wants you to have the proper life, the eternal life, the abundant life, the life that is benefited by righteousness, his righteousness, not only in the life to come, but right now. That's what he wants you to have. We want to encourage you in any way we can to take hold of that life and turn to God and become his. Give yourself back to him. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar. Render to God the things that are God's. Everybody focuses on that render to Caesar, but render to God the things that are God's. And that means you. So join us in returning to God. Be reconciled to God. He tells you how. Repent of your sins. Confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And be baptized. Be immersed. Have your sins washed away. And if we can help you with that, we want to invite you uh, to come and worship with us. We have Bible studies on Sunday mornings at 915 at the address on your screen, 14175 Green Street Northeast in Palmyra, Indiana. We also have our worship service at 10 a.m., which we also live stream, but we'd love to see you in person. We also have an evening worship at 5 p.m. Uh, on Sundays. And of course, we are uh, we, we do have this live stream at or recorded video in this case um, at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesdays, but we are talking about starting up in-person midweek Bible classes as well. If you have any questions, you can call us at 812-364-6215 or email me at preacher at palmyrachurchofchrist.org. We also have a Facebook page, facebook.com slash palmyra.churchofchrist. And of course, you can also, if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comments below. All right, if there's nothing else, uh, we're, we're getting done quick today, but I didn't feel comfortable moving on to the, the next part for just about five minutes. So we'll go ahead and close with a prayer and be virtually dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening thanking you for this day again that we've had to uh, join together and study your word. We pray, Father, that we are, uh, as we battle for our proper mindset, we, we do always look to you and respond appropriately to you and always depend on you uh, for the good works that we wear. May we always return ourselves to you as, you, as we bear your image. And may you give us that abundant life. Please give us that abundant life that we, we need as we serve you. May we always remember you are our Lord, you are our King, and that we, we need to serve you every day to the, with our whole being. Thank you so much for giving us your Son who offers, offered himself to be the sacrifice for our sins so that he could raise on the third day be and ascend to, to, to the throne to rule for all eternity. Help us to follow him and be faithful to you this we pray in Jesus' name.